He was, you know, he made three trips uh, to Southeast Asia, to Japan, and to the United States, went back to Beijing and said, I've done my work, now it's up to you. <laughs> and he never left China again. Uh, but in those three trips, he did recreate the international environment that China lived in. It was, he wanted a peaceful environment, uh, and he wanted a peaceful environment because he was convinced that was the only way China was going to develop economically, and it did. I think if you look at both the Nixon trips and this change of foreign policy by Deng Xiaoping, the combination really ended the Cold War in Asia. The Cold War would go on for a number of years more in Europe, but in Asia it was really basically over. And what ensued was some four decades of peace and prosperity. I'd say that's a pretty good indication that engagement worked. In fact, spectacularly well. Um, engagement at that time for Richard Nixon, for other American leaders in the 80s and beyond, really meant pulling China into the world as one member of the global community. It wasn't about democratization. There's, there's a difference. It's about taking up your rightful position in an international order. Um, the, um, in any case, um, let me just, so, oh yes, uh, it was, um, you remember Robert Zolich in 2005 gave a major speech in which he called on China to become a responsible stakeholder. I think that uh, notion of a responsible stakeholder tells you really what engagement is all about. It says we want China to be a stakeholder, uh, but we also want it to be a responsible one. That is to say, we want to engage China to bring China into the world, but we're we think China is being irresponsible, we'll push back. So engagement has always had two sides. The idea that China was, uh, that engagement meant that the United States was laying down some sort of a doormat and saying, please walk all over us, is just crazy. It's a new invention of some pundits in Washington. Um, it has always been a two-handed policy. It has always gone with some version of hedging. So there's engagement on the one hand and hedging, which is to say taking measures that China doesn't always like, on the other. It's, and th that has been a very deliberate policy mix for a very long time. Uh, and it um, really is about what people in Washington would call shaping China's behavior. Shaping China's behavior is not always easy. Uh, we would like China to do things that China doesn't always want to do, um, so forth. That's natural. That's the way the world works. You don't always shape it exactly the way you want it or as quickly as you would like, but you try to do that and you try to get it, this relationship in one way or another to work. Uh, so. Uh, it's the, when I, you know, you, engagement, uh, Ian Johnston and uh, Bob Ross once defined as, as an effort to ameliorate the non-status quo tendencies of a rising power. It's a way of coping with a power that is rising, bringing them into the world with the hope that they will join the international, the global order. Which is not to say that that international global order can't be reshaped to one degree or another, but largely within that context. And when I say hope, I don't mean naive hope. That's what's being charged in Washington these days, is that um, people who were in favor of engagement are naive, um, dreaming, um, you know, I don't know, radical hippies or something, uh, that they're not realistic. Uh, and they say basically that they have been deceived 
and now we need to go on to something else. Um, uh, I think that, in fact, the United States had a pretty good sense of China. It wasn't that they were fooled by what China was doing. I've been in and around watching China. I've, I'm not a policymaker, but I certainly have had more than a few conversations with policymakers over the years. And I think that the United States had a pretty good idea. They were watching an economy that was changing. Uh, it was also uh, rapidly privatizing. Uh, the emergence of township and village enterprises, the emergence of, I shouldn't call it private farming, but certainly family farming uh, in China. Um, you know, th this growing economy. We knew that the military was being modernized. That was not a surprise. Uh, all these things uh, we knew. We also knew that the Chinese Communist Party was not democratizing. That is not a surprise. Uh, and if anybody thought that it was, 1989 was a very sharp reminder that it was not. Um, so I don't think that those of us who favored a policy of engagement were dreaming, were naive, were deceived. Um, but I think things have changed. And the conversation in Washington has certainly changed, but I think the conversation in Beijing has changed as well. Um, and that's, I think, has brought this argument, made it much sharper. So what's changed? Um, I think some of the changes are more continuities than they are actual changes. You think of economic development. That's been going on for a long time. But at some point, quantitative change becomes qualitative change. When China joined the WTO in uh, 2001, its GDP, at least if you use exchange rate um, figures, was about 1.2 trillion, which at the time was about 9% of the US economy, which was about 13.23 billion at the time. So it was still very much in the shadow of the American economy. Today, uh, that's changed substantially. Uh, the Chinese economy is about 13 trillion, again using exchange rate, or about two-thirds the size of the U.S. economy, uh, which is about 19 billion, a trillion, sorry. Uh, well, you've gone from about 10 percent of the U.S. economy to about two-thirds of the U.S. economy in uh, 20 years. That is a big change. It is a continuity, but it's also a qualitative change in the relationship. The really rather large gap between the two economies has narrowed considerably in 20 years, and if you do straight line projections, it will continue to narrow and reverse. Which, by the way, I might add, I do expect at some point, China with 1.4 billion citizens is going to have a larger economy than the US. It should. Uh, that's why it's really important to work out some of the rules of the road before you have that um, change. OK. Um, uh, you know, the, the larger size of the Chinese economy is not just a matter of the numbers and um, being larger, being a higher percentage of the US GDP. It's also that China's position in the global economy has changed. If you go back about 10 years, I think most states in Asia did more trade with the United States than they did with China. Today that's not the case. Now I think every one of China's neighbors has more trade, and maybe even substantially more trade, with China than with the United States. And that does begin to change the political dynamics of the region. And that's part of the conversation that is going on. Um, Another continuity that's grown into a, uh, a major problem, I suppose, are the complaints of U.S. businesses, and not just U.S. businesses, uh, all international businesses in Beijing. If you read the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce report in Beijing, annual report, every year they're complaining about forced technology transfer, intellectual property rights violations, an increasingly difficult environment. Um, you know, and I think that Beijing bears 
considerable blame in not heeding some of those complaints. Uh, because, first of all, I, I do think that those complaints are legitimate and they do reflect substantial um, violation of WTO agreements. Uh, this, you know, WTO does provide for market access and that the both sides of the WTO agreement are supposed to gain for it and this was a substantial turning of the back uh, on that, those agreements. In fact, uh, again, spending time on YouTube, I heard Charlene Barshevsky who negotiated um, a large part of that WTO agreement uh, argue that China should either comply with WTO or withdraw. That was, a, I think, a pretty flank, frank and blunt challenge. But the other side of that, the political side of that, was if you look at Sino-US relations, uh, particularly after 1989 and particularly after China's entry into the WTO, what underlay this, this relationship? It was economics, the business between these two countries, right? Uh, and if you alienate the supporters of this relationship, then sooner or later the relationship, the foundation of that relationship is going to erode. And that has happened. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody in the business community thinks that bilateral tri trade deficits are a serious problem. I don't think anybody in the business community thinks that tariffs is a way to solve anything. But they're so frustrated with China and market access and all these other issues that they will support the Trump administration as it talks about these things. Uh, we have yet to see what agreement, if any agreement, comes out of our ongoing um, discussions. But if it's all about trade balance, then we won't have made any progress at all. Uh, it has to address these other issues. We'll, we'll see, at least I hope we'll see, at least some sort of an agreement and an opportunity to judge where they're, um, um, whether they've at least addressed the issue. Okay. Um, I think the other changes that we've seen have been more rapid and um, substantial. Uh, certainly foreign policy, China's foreign policy has changed. I don't think that there's any question that China is more assertive now than it was, pick a date, um, maybe 2008, something like that. Uh, you could go back to the, I suppose, the Asian financial crisis, but certainly 2008. Uh, and of course, part of uh, picking 2008 uh, as a date, that marks a real turning point because uh, the U.S. really screwed up. It screwed up big time. Um, that was our fault. Uh, whether you were Asian uh, des deserved the blame for the Asian financial crisis, I, I think Jeff Sachs had some uh, different opinions on that. Uh, you know, at any case, uh, 2008 was clearly an American um, failure, a failure of our s regulatory system, uh, and. You know, it really changed opinion in China. Uh, I think you have all have probably seen the exchange between Wang Qishan and Hank Paulson. Uh, I think he was then Secretary of Treasury. Uh, Wang Qishan saying to him, you, the United States, used to be the teacher, but you've made mistakes and we no longer have to study you. Uh, <laughs> so that pretty confrontational, um, pretty direct, pretty blunt. Uh, it really did change uh, the image of the United States in China. Uh, I think that China really tended to go to an extreme on that. It uh, overread it. And I remember a few years after that crisis uh, talking to people in Beijing that commented on how rapidly the U.S. economy was bouncing back from that. And I said, well, that's kind of what free market economies always do. Uh, you know, they screw up, they have these booms, they bust, but, you know, the inefficient ones um, fail and you end up with a more robust, uh, stronger economy coming out of that. 
it's not that I'm recommending that uh, path, it's that I think that that happens and you know, it should be expected. Uh, but we've seen a lot of other uh, challenges in foreign policy. That was part of it. I think the change in sort of attitude was important there. But we've also seen major problems between China and Japan, especially on those islands that are um, called Senkaku on one side of the, the sea and Diaoyu on the other side of the sea. Uh, that's been a major issue. There are a lot of other political issues between the two. Um, we've seen the island building campaign in the South China Sea, uh, which you all are aware of. Um, the attitudinal change, I'm sure in Singapore you all remember uh, um, Yang Jiechi telling your foreign minister uh, that China's a big country and you're just a small country, and that's just a fact. That's, you know, China didn't seem to use to do those sorts of things. It may have thought that, but it had more sense than to say things like that. Um, those uh, things. I think we see mounting pressure on Taiwan. Um, and of course, we now have the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, it seems to be uh, designed as some sort of geoeconomic political strategy to extend Chinese influence uh, in many parts of the world, uh, including especially Southeast Asia. Uh, I think the good news here is that you are seeing increasing evidence of pushback from countries around the world, especially on the BRI issue, but also on a lot of these other foreign policy issues. And then, you know, we have um, technology issues that I don't want to go into in any depth, but cyber theft, it really is an issue. Um, there, China has in one way or another acquired illegally a great deal of intellectual property rights, not just from the United States, but from many other countries. And of course, what, what really has emerged is um, a credit to China. They've, a lot of smart people have been working very hard, and they've made a lot of progress on technology, much faster than I think people outside of China expected. And now they really are on the cutting edge of a lot of technologies. Uh, the 5G and artificial intelligence come up repeatedly. And so what we have is not just a trade war, it's much more importantly, it's a technology war. And so whatever comes out of these present talks is certainly going to be going on for a very long time. Um, uh, oh, the, the Made in China 2025 was, of course, the, um, that, that document, I re think, really shook up a lot of people in Washington and around the world, uh, maybe because of some of the commentary uh, about how China was ne not going to just compete in these areas, but dominate these areas. And uh, public subsidies, state subsidies, have been pouring into some of these high technology areas. Very, very large sums of money being put into this. Um, I just saw a chart, by the way, of, of Huawei's investment in R&D that you know, it, like every other company, telecommunication company in the world, it was going along fairly flat for many years. And about 2014, just as you know, Made in China 2015 is 2025 is being formulated. All of a sudden, it takes off. Everybody else remains flat. Huawei takes off. I think you're going to see that in many, many industries in China. Uh, so that's another change that has, I think, startled. Uh, the world. And then, I, you know, China has changed internally. This is very obvious to a lot of us who go to China frequently. Um, I think, you remember document number nine back in 2013, the uh, famous uh, propaganda document that said, don't talk about Western constitutionalism, the the Qigabu Jiang, uh, Western constitutionalism, neoliberal economics, universal values, uh, civil society, these and others were all bad, bad words. Um, and I, I guess maybe we didn't take that document seriously enough at the time. It seems to me to have presaged a really a great tightening of ideology in China. And certainly, as an academic, when I go to China, I see academic friends, and they are very concerned with the 
current atmosphere in China. Um, you know, you've had a crackdown on lawyers. Despite the plenum decision on governing China through law, you've arrested the lawyers who were trying to do precisely that. Um, you know, 250 lawyers, uh, uh, and it's hard to make the case internally or internationally that you really want to be governed by law when lawyers cannot go to court on the basis of law and argue cases. Um, that's a major change. Uh, you can look at um, NGO sector, which is under great pressure. Um, you see greater uh, centralization, uh, greater surveillance, more regulation, and uh, unfortunately we've seen this uh, massive expansion of detention camps in uh, Xinjiang. Uh, these are all issues that have caught, um, that, that on the one hand suggest that China really has changed domestically uh, and also have caught the United States and other countries by surprise and said we need to react uh, to this. So when I say that there have been continuities, there have been continuities, but there have also been changes. So where are we going to go? Uh, as I suggested, tariffs and trade deficits are purely a distraction. They're not important. The other issues are important. And that's why I say you have to kind of separate out what's going on in the Trump White House, if anybody can figure that out, and what the real issues really are. Um, and the problem, I think, in the United States is that I don't think we have any sort of consensus. If there's a consensus that we need a new policy mix, there's no consensus on what that policy mix should be. Certainly there are people who focus on security issues and say we need to confront China on a, well, if I say militarily, I don't mean going to war, but, um, but on a security issues. Uh, you know, for instance, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. Um, ships, uh, just the other day, there were a couple of ships, naval vessels that went through the Taiwan Straits. Um, these sorts of issues. There are people who would put their priority on that. Uh, obviously, there are others who say technology first. Others who look at broader economic indicators and say that's important. And then uh, the human rights people who say that's really the fundamental issue. Uh, so we don't really have any sort of consensus in Washington. And now this is one part where maybe it does sound a bit partisan, but the White House itself seems deeply divided on a lot of these issues. And so you don't have an administration with a clear-cut agenda saying, go in this direction. And I think that that is a problem, and that is not going to uh, ease quickly. So what to do? Um, well, let me start with what not to do. Uh, you remember ZTE? telecommunications firm, uh, you know, ZTE violated sanctions on North Korea. Clearly, uh, the evidence was not circumspect, it was or hidden, ambiguous. We had emails, we had photographs, we had everything. Xi Jinping calls, says, Donald, would you mind taking the sanctions off ZTE? Oh, sure. What is this all about? We do not have an explanation from the administration on what are sanctionable activities. Uh, that was one where I think ZTE was simply wrong. It was caught doing wrong. So there should be sanctions. We can discuss what those sanctions should be, but you don't turn around a week later and say, oh, gee, I didn't mean that. You need some policy consistency. What, what exactly do you mean? Um, I have no idea whether the fate of Meng Wanzhou is being negotiated in these tri uh, trade negotiations or not. But if it is, that's a, you know, whether she should or should not have been arrested is one thing. But you don't have hostages in a trade negotiation. That's a legal matter, and keeping those things separate is very important to the United States uh, in the long run. Um, I think that 
The most important thing the United States can do to make engagement work is to get our own house in order. If China is spending more on R&D, the United States needs to spend more on R&D. You know, U.S. spending on R&D has been relatively flat over the years. Chinese R&D has been going up. Well, of course their technology is getting better. Why aren't we spending more on R&D? That's a pretty simple, straightforward uh, problem that could be solved um, both by companies and by government action. Um, uh, you know, uh, there is going to be a technology competition. Um, if I can take advantage of my old age, um, <laughs> uh, I do remember Sputnik going up. Uh, and that was 1957. I was born in 1949. I was a little boy of eight years old. Um, but I do remember going out in the yard. Our family had a telescope. And we'd watch Sputnik go across the sky. And what did the United States government do? It passed the National Defense Education Act. The US is the only nation in the world, I think, that when it wants to spend more money on education, calls it defense. I don't care what they call it. It sent me to graduate school. <laughs> uh, I learned a little bit of Chinese. Uh, in any case, um, you know, why are we doing the same thing? I have not heard anybody in Washington or elsewhere talk about, you know, some form of NDA sort of program to up our, you know, R&D game to, you know, cultivate science and technology. That certainly needs to be done. Um, you know, cybersecurity. I can remember a few years ago. Uh, the Obama administration had a program, tried to introduce into law, uh, about requiring certain technological standards for cybersecurity. Businesses thought it was too expensive, so we didn't do anything. And now we complain about uh, cyber theft. Come on, guys, get your act together and figure out what combination of private and public spending and standards and knowledge sharing can better ensure uh, secure networks. That should be fairly straightforward. Um, CFIUS, uh, CFIUS stands for um, the Committee for International, uh, an International Investment into the US. Uh, I think I got the translation of that a little bit wrong. But CFIUS is one of these things. It's supposed to um, say when foreign countries invest in the United States, does it pose a threat to US national security? Um, what it didn't, didn't do was talk about US companies selling sensitive technology to China, the outgoing stuff. And you know, China's a smart place. They figured this out and bought some technology. A company by the name of AMD sold the X86 chip to China, licensed it. Uh, this is a very important chip. Uh, it is in a lot of Intel products. It's in a lot of U.S. weapon systems. And it was licensed without complaint by AMD to China. This is why uh, CFIUS is being reformed into something that was called FIRMA, uh, which has now been folded into the National Authorization Defense Act. Uh, I don't believe the implementing provisions of that have yet been worked out. But that is an area where we clearly need some uh, rethinking of um, our investment and security policies without, I hope, making them all subject to the Pentagon, without the Commerce Department weighing in. This is, again, one of those balances that we need to figure out. Um, uh, obviously, supporting businesses in terms of market access and those sorts of things is also important. Um, let me add, as I put uh, all these sort of defensive or whatever measures on the table, to say it's also important to look for areas where we can cooperate with China. Uh, a friend of mine recently put it, um, play the ball, not the man. Uh, that's a sports analogy, right? Uh, in other words, that gets back to where I started my comments. Criticize China where you think China is wrong. But don't criticize China when China's not wrong. 
And when we did not join the AIIB, I thought we made a terrible mistake. Uh, that was, um, you know, an area where we had potential cooperation in, with China. Those areas should be pursued. Um, investment into the United States that is not uh, related to national security should be welcomed. Uh, dare I say Chinese students should be welcomed. That's an area that I'm very concerned about because the atmosphere in Washington, there's a little bit of this sort of neo-McCarthy atmosphere that is coming up. Uh, you know, I, I worry about that and I, I certainly want to reassure my Chinese students that they're welcome. Um, you know, I hope the government will do the same thing. Uh, but I think that that's important, not only for educational reasons, but cultural interchange is really important, especially when pursued over a very long period of time. Uh, Mary Bullock wrote an interesting book on the history of the Rockefeller Foundation, which needless to say went through a few rough times between when it was established in the late 19th century and the present. There was a revolution and a cultural revolution in between and the Rockefeller Foundation is still doing good work in China and so these long-term educational exchanges are very important. Um, oh, <laughs> the most obvious one, I suppose you in Singapore will be amused by this, um, we should work with our partners and allies. <laughs> there was this thing called TPP, <laughs> you, you think uh, not joining AIIB was a mistake. Pulling out of TPP was, you know, shooting both feet at the same time. I mean, this was just, you know, how can you be that dumb? Uh, you know, I say that knowing that not only did Donald Trump oppose it in the campaign, Bernie Sanders opposed it and Hillary Clinton opposed it. Having called it the gold standard of trade agreements, she came around to opposing it. You know, I mean, this is, this is where you worry that it's not just the politicians who are, who are having problems, but the American public. Uh, you know, I really, I, th you know, personally thought that Hillary Clinton made a horrible mistake in bending to that political wind. I think she could have been a much more formidable candidate and leader if she had stood up to Sanders and Trump and said, no, this trade agreement is good. It's good for the American economy. It's good for American workers. And let me explain to you why. Um, I th think she would have gotten a lot of credit for that. Uh, instead of when you bend to the wind, she had a reputation of always trimming her sails to the political winds. And doing that one more time just, I thought, played into that uh, meme and hurt her campaign. I'm not a political advisor, and now you know why. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> just my thoughts. In other words, I think that there are a number of policy things that the United States could do that would readjust and revivify engagement. Uh, it's not a matter of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, what, does, what does saying engagement has failed mean? Does it mean we're not going to talk to China anymore? How do you do that? How do you decouple your economy? Some people talk about that. How many flights a week are there between the United States and China? It's hundreds. You cannot disengage. Uh, you have to keep talking and you have to, you do have to reshape your policy mix but this is not something that is new. As I say, engagement from the beginning was always a matter of engagement on the one hand, hedging on the other. Okay, we have to change the mix, change the mix, but don't give up on engagement. Thank you very much.